Now, from CBS News Miami, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFiti. Welcome to Facing South Florida. I'm Jim DeFiti. State Representative Danny Perez will be the Speaker of the Florida House during next year's session, making him one of the most powerful men in the state. What kind of speaker will he be? What are his priorities? And what kind of relationship is he likely to forge with the governor? Well, luckily to answer all those questions, Danny Perez is here with us this morning. Uh, so, De Speaker Designate Perez, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, I want I do want to look ahead, but let's first take a let's first look about what was accomplished in this session. What is your maiden takeaway from this year's legislative session? What do you think this session will be remembered for? I think the entire term will be remembered under Speaker Renner, of course, as a term where we took care of our children, where we restored rights for our parents. This session specifically, Jim, our most controversial issue, our most important issue was what started off as HB1 eventually evolved into HB3, which had to do with social media and making sure that parents uh, were able to be involved in their children's lives and give them consent on what apps they were able to use after a certain age in the social media world. You, you expect the governor to sign that bill? I do. I do expect the governor to sign it. Uh, we've worked together with the governor uh, and the Senate president. Uh, the, sp the speaker did a phenomenal job of working together uh, with all of our partners to get this across the finish line, and I, I do, I, I do expect that to, to, to see the finish line. All right. One of the one of the issues that I did want to discuss with you, and including some of your priorities before, but I want to talk to you about some of the more controversial things. There weren't a lot of controversial issues this time around, but there were a few, and and one of the things is the preemption. On living wage ordinances here in Miami-Dade. This is a, a, across the state. Miami-Dade has passed a measure that allows or requires subcontractors, for instance, at the airport and others, to have to pay a higher wage than the state minimum wage because they recognize that cost of living in Miami is higher. You know that as well. Yet, the legislature, and you voted for this, voted to preempt that and said that local governments cannot require employers to pay more than the state minimum wage. Why, you know, as a result, families are going to lose out a lot of money that they would have otherwise been paid. Why did you vote for that? The, the place where I come from, Jim, is I see myself as a servant of the public, of my constituents. And in saying that, that includes the tax dollars that are being sent to the state on behalf of my own constituents. And I have to make sure that when those tax dollars are being used, that they're being used uh, to the best of its purpose. And so the way that we have it right now is minimum wage exists. And obviously, it is increasing, which is a good thing. It, minimum wage is increasing as time goes on and eventually will get to its final point. But what we want to make sure is that when these contracts are being given to a subcontractor, for example, at the local level, that there isn't some sort of payment schedule where the payment being given is, uh, on behalf of the taxpayer, of course, is extremely high uh, or more than it should be. And we're seeing that at times. We're seeing that sometimes the contracts, they're, they're ballooned. And I think the more you balloon these contracts, the more you balloon these payrolls, what ends up happening is you have less resources for, for the rest of our communities. And, and that, that was my concern primarily. But this, is, but this is taking money out of the pockets of working people. I mean, we're not talking about the high-paid executives. You're talking about people who on the margins are barely able to get by, people who under a living wage ordinance might be required to be paid $15 or $16 an hour. Now they can be paid $12 or $13 an hour, wherever the state's minimum wage currently is. You know, a couple of dollars here or there can make a difference to a family. I, I, I would disagree, Jim. I would disagree. I think the, the problem that we're having, there, there, is a, there is a limited pot of money. There isn't an infinite amount of money. That m limited amount of money has to be used for as many resources as possible. What's happening is that we aren't reaching our full potential of, of resources that we can reach because we're using way too much on the front end on only certain projects because the wages are so high. I think if we go by what is the federal you standard, think, by the way. You think wages are too high in South Florida? In you think people the, are making too much money in down here? In some of the subcontractors, in some of their in some of their uh, their contracts, absolutely, because there's no cap. So they can give whatever it is that they want. And what we're doing is we're taking away from other resources and other projects mm. that are absolutely necessary in Miami. We have so much here in Miami. We have over 1,000 people moving moving a day to Florida, and where are they coming? Miami's one of those stops. I want to make sure that we have as much projects well, as possible on the front end. Let's take a step back for a second philosophically, because this issue comes up all the time, the idea of preemption. I know, as a state legislator, you hate it when Washington, either the Biden administration or any administration, dictates things for the state to do. 
You don't like it when Washington dictates the state of Florida. So why is it okay then for politicians in Tallahassee to dictate to local governments? Why not keep government closest to the people at the local level? If local leaders think that it's in the best interest to raise salaries or to pass heat ordinances or do any of the types of things, why not trust the local governments to do that? Well, we do trust our local government, but at the same time, we look at we look at ourselves as an accountability leg of government. Uh, when we talk about heat exposure and the heat ordinance here in Miami, uh, that was a, that was a hot topic, and it was one that your show spoke no about. Pun in, right? No pun intended. <laughs> no pun intended. Yes. But Jim, well, we're not we're not saying that we don't want the right requirements for our workers that are working under the sun. Quite the opposite; they already exist, and those standards exist under OSHA. But what what was trying to be implemented at the local level here in Miami was uh, an intrusion on small businesses. That's how we side and so we want to make sure that we separate those we don't want this gotcha moment that could potentially happen at the local level with what was being presented as a heat exposure requirement those standards already exist at the federal level and and we have to go back to what is our role of government limited government is an important principle of the state of florida not just of the republican party everyone wants to be able to do what they believe is in the best interest of them and their families small businesses are the same way and we don't want these requirements to intrude into the small business world and that's what we did as a government in tallahassee as a legislature in tallahassee we protected small businesses all right uh, you know, the last time I saw you, I was in Tallahassee on the mental health issue, and you met with Cindy Murphy, the woman who we're actually interviewing again in the in the next segment to talk about mental health issues. And and I know that this was something that you care about, and you you know you helped push and pass the the bill to reform the Baker Act, which we're going to talk about later in the show. Um, but in mental health in general, I know issues regarding developmental disability is another area to talk to you, but. Let's stay on the mental health for a second. Um, I think that, that the steps that were taken this year are a good first step, but I guess I want to get a sense for you. This isn't the end of the line. This is just really the beginning in trying to address some of those mental health issues. In talking to Representative Maney, who pushed a lot of this, he sees this as a first step. Do you agree? I absolutely agree. Mental health, unfortunately, is one of the most important issues that we have before us as a community today here in Miami, but really across the state of Florida. And we've paid attention to that in Tallahassee, not just with the changes that Representative Maney has done uh, with the Baker Act, with the access to courts, with making sure that the right dollars are following uh, the right patients. Uh, Judge Maney, by the way, and I call him Judge Maney because he's probably the most accomplished representative we have in the House. Mm -hmm. He's a general, he is a former judge, and he's a representative. So our respect for him is tremendous. And uh, Judge Maney made sure that the policy didn't just pass, but also the fiscal side of things. I mean, we put hundreds of millions of dollars into the mental health services in our state. Uh, for example, we needed more beds in mental health clinics. We put $77.8 million into increasing the amount of beds in our mental health clinics to make sure that that service is there for our constituency. And I think we're going to continue to look at that. You know, how do we increase the services? How do we provide those services to the most vulnerable populations? And we'll have that discussion coming next session as well. I know I know you oppose Medicaid expansion. Speaker Renner opposed Medicaid expansion. Senate President Pasadomo opposes it. Uh, I do want to ask you, though, um, you know, it just seems to me that if in the search for dollars, we're leaving billions of dollars on the table by not expanding Medicaid. But let me let me offer this to you because I in the conversation I have with Judge Leifman in the next segment, which I taped earlier, you know he talks about there's something called a 1959 Medicaid waiver that other states like Florida is one of ten states that has not expanded Medicaid. Texas is another one, but Texas looked into and and sought an, a a waiver on Medicaid for mental illness type issues, and they were able to get at least part of that money to that targeted community. I know that you're opposed to general Medicaid expansion, but with the issue of maybe a limited expansion in mental health, is that something you'd be open to considering? The the topic of Medicaid expansion has been around for a while, Jim, and it's been litigated in the House many times and uh, has never come to fruition, and I, and I don't see that change. In, in the Florida Why House of Representatives. That? When we talk about Medicaid expansion, I think the, the term itself is so interesting. What, is that, what does that truly mean? When we're talking about Medicaid expansion, we're, we're expanding Medicaid potentially under, under that law mm -hmm. if it were to happen. We are expanding Medicaid to an able-bodied adult. And what's an able-bodied adult? That's a person like myself who's very blessed, very healthy, a 36-year-old man who has the ability to wake up, provide for themselves and their families. What, what we need to be asking ourselves is how do we increase access to health care to the most vulnerable population, which is our current responsibility? In that population, you have mental health. 
you have the developmentally disabled. Uh, how do we increase access? How do we increase quality? And we've done that, but no one really seems to want to discuss that. I'll give you an example, Jim. We increased reimbursement rates in Medicaid mm -hmm. for pediatrics over $40 million this past session. Mental health, hundreds of millions of dollars. Although technically different, the developmentally disabled on a wait list. Can you believe that there's a wait list for the developmentally disabled to receive health care services? And we're looking for a way to eliminate that wait list so the most vulnerable populations receive the services. That's our job, but increasing Medicaid to a person like myself who is blessed to be able to work and provide for himself and his family, I, I, I philosophically disagree with that, Jim. I gotta, I gotta point out there's an irony here in the sense of, you know, at the same time you want able-bodied people to be able to pay for health insurance and get health insurance through, uh, presumably through their employer or working, but at the same time, it, what we're talking about is really a lot of people who fall in that gap who don't, who don't earn so little that they qualify for Medicaid, but not enough to be able to pay for health insurance, and when you when you undermine the the living wage ordinance here in Dade, it makes it harder for people. And I, I don't want to belabor it. There are 800,000 roughly Floridians without health insurance right now that would be covered. But I want to. We only have about a minute or so left. What are your biggest priorities as you look ahead to planning your future for next year, next session? What are the key things that you want to do? What is a, a Danny Perez term as speaker going to look like? If I can make the state of Florida more affordable for every single Floridian, the current, the future, and the past. I succeeded as a speaker. It's the greatest issue we have before us. Quite frankly, inflation, although it's, it, it's getting minimally better, it's still a massive problem uh, in the state of Florida. I think a lot of that has to do with the federal government, and we'll see what the election holds here in November. But Jim, if I can make it easier for a family to stay in Florida that was raised here, that wants to create their family here and create their businesses here, then I succeeded as speaker. Uh, I, I don't want to see people leave the state of Florida because of affordability. And it's a, it's a big issue that we have before us from a variety of angles, but I hope to tackle that over the next two years. Yeah, and I appreciate always you coming in. You're, you're never afraid to sort of answer questions, which is always great. And I really want to continue this conversation, especially as you get closer to the start of your term, you know, in a few months, you know, really what your priorities are. And if you want, you know, I'd like to maybe even, you could pick a single topic and we can come in and spend a, like the entire segment just talking and diving into that subject. Does that sound like an idea? That's a deal, Jim. We can do several of them. So, deal. Danny Perez, thank you very much for thank coming you. in. I think this is going to be a lot of interest. It's going to be interesting seeing how this all goes. Thank you. All right. When we come back, we'll talk to Cindy Murphy about this year's session. Stay with us. Welcome back. After ignoring the issue for years, the Florida legislature started to address the mental health crisis in the criminal justice system. This is an issue we've been focusing on here at CBS and following our documentary last year, Warehouse, the Life and Death of Tristan Murphy, we wanted to see what the legislature has done. Now, the biggest change this year was a reform to the state's Baker Act, the law that allows police and family members to involuntarily commit a person to a psychiatric facility for 72 hours if they pose an imminent threat to themselves or others. However, the law doesn't provide much help when that 72 hours comes to an end. But a measure passed this year by the legislature requires that type of follow-up care that had been missing. Earlier this week, I spoke to Judge Steve Leifman for his assessment of what the legislature accomplished. I mean, just to put it in some context, uh, this is probably the biggest change in 60 years in the Baker Act. Um, so it's not an easy thing to do. There's all kinds of competing, I don't want to call them interests, but there's competing ideas and philosophy when it comes to civil commitment. So it makes it complicated to open that door. Um, I first want to say that the work that you did helped tremendously because it really helped put this issue at the forefront and in front of legislators who don't see this usually as the big issue that it is. And uh, Representative, you know, former Judge Maney also did a remarkable job because he used to do civil commitment cases when he was up in Okaloosa. Um, so, um, you know, it was a very good uh, step in the right direction. Uh, I particularly like the idea that there's required handoffs and treatment for people coming out of that system. Right now, most people just get dropped, and that's part of the problem. Um, they made some tinkering. They did some tinkering around the process. Um, I think the next level, what needs to be done, however, is that we do need to modernize the actual criteria. 
I also believe that the legislature did some increased funding for the 988 system. Uh, but there were other bills, other issues that they could have taken up that they weren't able to. But again, you've been around long enough. This is a process. You know, as you start to look towards next year, next cycle, um, what are going to be the main priorities that you're going to want to see from the legislature beyond expanding the criteria sure. for the Baker Act? What other things do you want to see them take up? Yeah, and and I think that's the nice thing. You know, Representative Maney is like in the middle of his uh, term limit at this point, and he has um, really become the expert in the legislature on this issue. And I know that he is committed to continuing to improve it. So I think he wants to a um, you know, modernize the criteria. B, we still need to improve the process in terms of how people get access to the court and how that process moves. You know, one of the things that that I've been pointing out and 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 have come back to a few times is the issue of, you know, expanding Medicaid so that so that people, who are unable to right now get health insurance, as was the case with Tristan Murphy, you know, may be able to get the mental health care and the, and the physical health care that they actually need that right now they're not able to receive here in the state of Florida. Are there other things that you're looking for? And, and well, more well, broadly, are you, you know, do you see this, do you see at least some sort of a positive sign in terms yeah, of yeah. the fact that these things are actually being discussed? I, I am very encouraged and I, and I think it, for, you know, and looking back, this was a great session for mental health and substance use or behavioral health. Um, but I will tell you, there is a an alternative to expanding all of Medicaid to help this population. Florida should apply for what's called the 1915I waiver, which Texas has done and several of the other southern states that don't want to expand. They can get expanded Medicaid just for behavioral health by getting a waiver from the federal government. And it's cheaper, it doesn't expand the whole thing. And if that's something they don't want to do, this is a really good alternative to bring billions of new dollars into our system. I mean, Florida gives away about $52 billion in Medicaid expansion dollars of taxes we've already paid. I don't think people understand that. And so a lot of people can't get access to quality care and they end up on the street or homeless or in jail. And and so it, it's it's a serious, serious problem, but there are ways to improve it without expanding the whole thing. I also spoke to Cindy Murphy, Tristan's mother. Tristan, as you may recall, was a diagnosed schizophrenic who went to prison on a littering charge and killed himself with a chainsaw after failing to receive the treatment and medication he required. During the session this year, Tristan's mother traveled to Tallahassee to testify before the Senate committee and meet with legislators. Here are her thoughts on what the legislature did. Well, certainly there wasn't as much accomplished as I would have liked, um, but I have really big goals. I mean, I think the whole system needs to be fundamentally changed and that's not gonna happen overnight, but um, I was encouraged, um, for example, the changes with the Baker Act. I think those are very positive. Um, with the Baker Act, um, I'm glad that there's some funding behind it now so that there can be some sort of wraparound services for people who are involuntarily um, held for treatment and evaluation, um, you know, when they're in a crisis. That's really, really good. And I think just the changes of the Baker Act, it just sort of raises the uh, awareness of diversion, just the whole idea of diversion. I think that's really important. I know that's something that's near and dear to Judge Leifman as well. Um, because Tristan, I think, should have been diverted out of the criminal justice system. We've got to stop criminalizing people who have mental health issues. And so just, I think it goes, it's a big step in the right direction to recognizing that we shouldn't just automatically be, you know, packing people away either for mental health treatment or, or criminalizing them and putting them in jails. We've got to look at different ways that we can divert them and the support that they have with their families, the support they have in the community, other resources that we may have available to people to deal with mental health. So, you know, that's good. Um, you know, when I went up to Tallahassee at first, I didn't think that there was going to be anything much accomplished. Um, I'd been told that the legislative legislatures weren't, weren't really interested in mental health issues, particularly when they were linked to the criminal justice system. But I found just the opposite when I went up there. I found a lot of very caring, compassionate people, very passionate people um, who really care about these issues and care about change. Um, I really kind of felt like 
you know, there's this whole big mountain of change that needs to be made, but there's more people gathering at the bottom of the mountain to tackle it. And so that was encouraging. The legislature so far continues to refuse to accept the idea of Medicaid expansion. I think that's one of the things you'd like to see them reconsider maybe going forward next year and the years after. Oh, absolutely. I hate that this is a political issue because it shouldn't be. It should be what's in the best interest of our state and what's in the best interest of the individuals in our state. Doing this, what you did this year and sort of speaking out, uh, I know it's been difficult and I, I know that there's probably part of you that just wants to put this to the side and, and no one would be upset if you decided not to continue to advocate. That's, you know, you have a lot going. You're, you're raising Tristan's two sons, you know, and, and dealing with, you know, your own life and, and taking on this battle as well. Why, you know, do you think that you'll continue? How long can you continue doing this? And, and do you ever think about putting it aside and just sort of just, just worrying about yourself for a change? You know, it's funny because I was listening on the car radio uh, today on the way home to Time in a Bottle. I don't know if you remember that old Jim Croce song. And, you know, I started thinking about the time that I have in my life remaining and time with my grandchildren and time with uh, with Cody and Colton. And and is is this worth my efforts? Am I going to accomplish anything by doing all this or not? I don't know. But, you know, kind of bottom line, what it comes down to, Jim, and I said this at the end of um, the Senate hearing, um, when I was up there, I said, you know, I've got a 16 year old who knows what's going on, but I've got an eight year old who doesn't. Um, we haven't told Colton, uh, Tristan's youngest son, um, how he died. He knows that he died, but he thinks that he was just sick in his head and, and died. But he doesn't know all the whole circumstances surrounding him, which are just horrific. And someday I'm going to have to explain all that to him. And what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to say, look, Colton, this shouldn't have happened to your dad. You know, this was horrible what happened. He should have been treated better. He should have gotten better care. He should have, um, he should still be here with us, but he's not. And now Colton, let me tell you the good part. This is what happened because your dad died. I want this to be, if this can be a catalyst for change, if we can use this to change the system so that they can understand that, that, Tristan's life had meaning and um, accomplished something for other people, then, then yeah, I think I still need to keep battling it for, for those reasons. And, and, and just, I don't want anybody else to go through this. I mean, if we can, if, if my voice can create change, then I need to keep using my voice, no matter how hard it is. We'll be right back after the break. If you have any thoughts or comments, feel free to contact me at jdefeedy at cbs.com. I do enjoy hearing from you. Well, that's all the time we have. We'll be back again next week. Thanks again for watching and enjoy the rest of your day.